Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is a Cloud 2030 DevOps Lunch and Learn discussion uh, where we went deep into complexity and the cost of complexity after some discussions about what is cloud, why it's moving, not what is, but what's happening with cloud. Um, and we had this really interesting thought that we're going to explore more called the, that I said is the Jevons paradox of complexity. So meaning that complexity is getting less expensive, Heart, the price of complexity is going down, and that is encouraging us to add complexity, uh, which is Jevons paradox. So we explore that pretty deeply in this topic, uh, and it's a really good conversation, uh, lively, a lot of people contributed with a lot of points of view, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, check that out. If you like these discussions, please come to the 2030.cloud and participate. I have a fair number of days when I, I don't think that the next year or the next decade is going to be better than um, this one. Like that to part of the 2030 stuff is like, there's a, there's a meaningful chance that 10 years from now will not, we not, we won't be in a better position or the majority, you know, the vast majority of us won't be in a better position. Is that your, you are you define, saying sort of the same thing? Can you define what better position is? What do you mean by that? That's a good question. Um, quality of life. A funny thing is, I think uh, ability, um, yeah, quality of life, a, a confidence that you're gonna, that you're, you know, going to have, you know, that that your, the future, your future, is s stable and secure enough that you could sustain, you could weather you know, disruptive change or not being able to work or something like that. Um, and maybe this is just me, be, you know, reaching a new phase of adulthood, but um, I mean, the thing you were talking about, right? You know, what, uh, you know, sometimes I worry, it's like, all right, am I, am I going to have to worry about people just not having jobs anywhere um, and it all being controlled by corporations? Dude, we're already there. What are you talking about going to? Yeah, no, that's a that, 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 that's a uh, we're most of the way there already. Yeah, the horse have left the barn on those, man. The yeah, question no, is, how do we right. rein? I, I think I asked this question either on a, this on a Tuesday call or a Thursday call, and I think someone said it might have been you, Rob, who said that you know we've already left the barn on that one. The question is, what do we do now? And I guess my thing is, <laughs> yeah. you don't rein it in. But I, I, I don't, I look, I, my whole business model is based on R&D innovation, right? Yeah. It's, it's the core of what we do. So I know I contribute to this san insanity that we are, are, you know, whether it's AI, whether it's edge computer, whatever we're trying to do is to get more data so that we can drive better performance in what we deliver, right? Advanced technology to the point where we remove the bad driver in this using this metaphor right we remove the bad driver we want safety 5g is supposed to help us get there because if you have a 5g phone i know that you're about to come to an intersection my autonomous vehicle is coming to that intersection it goes whoops i know you're entering the intersection because your 5g phone told me so now i'm going to stop that's the goal right however what i've said is technologists bear the responsibility to not do this in ignorance and they must know that they are eliminating and they're creating fear in those that are at a certain age point that says, I only know how to do mine, the work in the mines. I only know how to do bagging groceries. Yeah. I only know how to do is drive a taxi or worse. If I'm in New York, I paid millions of dollars to the, to, to get my medallion because I was going to build my fortune and taking this one taxi and growing it to five or fleet of taxis. Now, yeah. what do I do? We are we are disrupting things much faster than we're thinking about the consequences. Yeah, and I I feel that, that way about that social media me. too. Yeah, Sorry, that concerns me. It just so, does. It, it yeah, concerns it's... me. We can think all we want, but ultimately, the the disruptive power of tech is certainly it's super linear, right? And maybe exponential and human experience is very linear 
That is, you, you get old with your skills and you get old with your music, right? You don't really change all much. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the change tends to be generational. Like uh, the, the people that are growing and raised into the change. Yes. The so, to to my mind, I agree with that. So the, the challenge is that if you look at previous ages, say, the transition from the Iron to the Bronze Age, right? That took hundreds of years. Generations managed it. The problem mm -hmm. now is that we're changing our technological foundation faster than humans, well, certainly faster than a human life, a lifespan. And so the real challenge is how to stay on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Will you be, I, need to be, by the way, forget all your worries. Will you need to be a great <laughs> swimmer? Because, I mean, will you need to be a great swimmer because all the icebergs are melting, right? <laughs> well, that's what actually in some ways maybe, and I think maybe this is how we all feel about it. The The answer is not to slow slow things down, but to uh, make, make things, you know, that we, we have challenges in front of us that are going to require require the faster innovation that we're pulling together so um i i mean this is like to keith's keith's comment for what we do you know we the automation that we're doing for infrastructure humans aren't doing it they can't do it they can't keep up with it it's not a human pro you know we're not we're not replacing a human process necessarily Well, you're 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 bringing greater efficiency to managing multiple environments and multiple servers, right? So think about this. Now it went. We went from being able to to, to produce or roll out servers um, in a fast, repeatable way to now we're basically managing multiple endpoints, regardless of their location and their size, yeah. leveraging a push button automation tool. And then you bring self healing, right? That the self fixes a node because the node went out of service. You, you run a playbook that executes that and does that for you. So now what I could do, I think about this team, the team I had at Verizon was able to manage the same footprint. It took 60 individuals in their standard um, operations deployment. It took six of, it took eight of us to do it. 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. making changes during the middle right. of the day, zero downtime, zero interruption. So but what you I don't what know. you said, Keith, what you said, Keith, that is really important is that you know tech will continue to do cool tech things. What our responsibility is to bring the rest of humanity along with us. That's just you know, we just have to do it. Otherwise we're gonna end up with more BS like whatever, probably and things, right? Here's me getting yeah. into politics. But, you know, people who are left out tend to find other ways to voice their frustration. Yes. I do not want a French Revolution. I do not want my head in the guillotine. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm there. There's way too much. I I, well, is, there's way too much comfort for a French Revolution, in my opinion. But I think it needs to be remembered, though. Like, you, remember, you mentioned comfort, but at the same time, I worry when it comes down to it, yeah, to some level, you can keep people happy if you keep them with a big screen TV and uh, an That's... unlimited cable. But right. at some point, humans are human, and part of that is for a lot of people, they enjoy driving. They enjoy – they get some meaning out of their job. They feel like they've accomplished something that yeah. they're not going to feel that same way if you just throw some money at them. To make them happy, right. and that really needs to be thought about is what what humanity really is. Yep, and, and that's the difference. Also, the, like the difference between working for sustenance and, and, and working for personal growth. Yeah. Like, right, we we are relatively privileged that our line of work is largely the, the later i mean it, it covers the former uh but we have a lot of mental leeway 
uh it like i a lot yeah yeah like if, if we were how would it be like a, like an assembly line worker or 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 like a yeah, like the, uh, a warehouse mm -hmm. worker that's horribly repetitive it 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 doesn't give you any personal growth you, you, i mean that and that's why it's being automated because there there is no mental work that needs to be done there and and mm -hmm. i mean it, it's it, 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 it's it, really dragging the people who are working there down by not allowing them to expand themselves you there's something you said made me think about the amazon like there's there's stuff about unionizing the amazon uh, warehouses in the press and there's some conversations about the working conditions and it's it's interesting that part of the the working conditions in in any of those circumstances are driven as much by the needs of the way the system is set up around that work because they were talking about them needing to work from like two in the morning to you know they were doing a 10-hour shift starting at two in the morning or something like that and it was really ten and a half hour Sorry, yeah. 10 and a half hour. That's, yeah, uh, so that, I read that right. Yeah, at yeah. two in the morning. And two in the morning is a really hard time to, to wake up um, and start your day. It was really messing with people. Especially if you have kids. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, and that they're doing that because that's structured, what, around the delivery cycles with yes. um, uh, when they when they have access to the roads and can get, get things out. So it's, it's interesting. We're a really interconnected uh, group of systems. And there's, so, really, there's nothing new there, right? No, there's nothing right. there. I agree. No. I, mean, I agree with that. It's nothing wage really slavery. New. I, it's but go ahead, John. Did you have well, no, I just look, I mean, let's just all conference. I got a contract in the background, so I keep muting. But you know, I, I think about this is you know, we're talking about um what, whether you went into trades or you went into so for the way, like in Hawaii right now, if you're in the trades, they're they're booming, yeah. they're working seven days a week. Um, yep. So I think some of it's cyclical and that stuff, but I think, you know, if you look at, I think with the Chinese and, and the heavy emphasis on STEM, right, early on to the education side, they started building the skill sets that are going to be needed for the next 20 or 30 years. I, I go back and look at, you know, what have we been teaching people, right? Are, are we preparing them? There's the group of people we have today and they're kind of in the state they're in, but then we, we know kind of what the future is going to need in terms of skill sets. No, are you're we, right. Yes. Absolutely. And and uh, so ultimately, it's all down to how well you educate. Well, yes. Can I challenge that assumption that we know what we're going to want? <laughs> can I challenge that a little bit? And challenge all the assumptions. <laughs> well, yeah. I've, done my, I've done my task. Right? <laughs> I've done my task. Huh? Go for it. No, I, I, the only reason I, and I say that is because I've had this discussion with educators, and I, and I do mm -hmm. have a definitive view on education. So let me preference that by saying as many things that I come across as an opinionated person, I have a definitive view. And I go back to our founding, in the States, I go back to the founding fathers of the United States, right? And I go, what, how, because we, we have gotten to this thing where we're technically educating now. We're, we're educating to almost the test. The test now is STEM, yeah. right? So we know what the answer is. So we're educating to the test. And I go, wow, what a mistake, because now we're creating task folks as yeah. opposed to creators. And I go back to the founding fathers that said, you know, all they read were, you know, you know, uh, classical texts. The blur, it's yep. the Bible. They read. They read and, and read. Well, yeah, they read. They had time to think, right? Time to create. And they mm -hmm. wrote and created things that we still leverage today as a part of society, leveraging what was done prior to that when you go back to Greece so and Rome. So I guess the question I have is, have we, is that a mistake? Is this assumption that we stop teaching people how to learn and we're teaching them no, I agree. this technique? Oh, I, I, hmm. I would agree with that. I think you have to create a... Your job as educators is to create challengers, not to teach to a test. I, I agree with you, but like, so I was, I was having a, I was listening to a conversation between my two oldest kids uh, last week, and they were discussing like non-Euclidean geometry. And 
at one point they turned to me and said, oh yeah, and they started, they went way down this rabbit hole. I'm like, where did you learn all this stuff? And they're like, oh, we've been watching this chain of, of YouTube videos and getting educated about stuff. The, the amount of knowledge for people who want to pursue it is... Uh, right. but, but, but there you also have to think, like, it's not the school that's providing that knowledge. It's, it's, it's not even providing the information that the knowledge is out there. They stumbled out on it on YouTube. Yeah. Well, interestingly, their feeds provided them the same path, right? It's the A. It's in some ways, it's the AIs uh, driving driving these. Uh, yeah, these. and uh, you see the the um, AIs are also the re responsible for feeding the extremism and whatnot because it's it's a you, it's a yeah well, they it's a so perspective. so. But, I'm happy to keep going down this path. I would. I was actually going to <laughs> rewind a little bit. So I had two things. One is I would. I would take us into GitOps, which was what I was, was interested in starting the WTF. Which GitOps. is more interesting? Come on, bro. Let's do that. Let's do that. Which? <laughs> well, what do you want to do? Um, but I had. A, I had a thought based on something that Keith had said, or the, where the conversation went um, about complexity. That I thought would be an interesting uh, transition point first. If that's all right. I, otherwise, let's, we, these are these are twenty what I consider Thursday conversations, I, although they're I'd always like to, interesting. I'd like to throw out a uh, uh, a mind questioning test, whatever. Um, uh, a little comparison, and that is, in lots of ways, where we're at right now with automating the the cloud. Uh, the, in, all the infrastructure, all the connected infrastructure is similar to where robotics was when they first started controlling mechanical, uh, mechanical uh, devices. And my worries is we're all separate. We're all going at it separate different ways. It's kind of sort of like open source and wild west. And yet when you look at robotics, the folks who have actually achieved the most is Boston yeah. Dynamics. And that's they're good because dancers. Yeah. They, well, they've been disciplined. They keep building upon what they had in the past. And so they literally have constructed this amazing uh, knowledge, knowledge tower of everything from physics and geospatial and uh, controls and control theory and, and air management and stuff. And they've gotten to something that's truly amazing, but where is the rest of the world on robotics? And so with cloud and infrastructure automation, can we do we think that there's going to be a single disciplined com company that comes out on this be far beyond where the rest of us are just kind of slapping things together and uh, doing automation, but not really getting that full focus and the whole experimentation of this works, this doesn't work, feedback loop with documentation and libraries uh -huh. that are the, the libraries that are curated to say these are the good parts and we've thrown out the bad already and we've documented why they're bad and not to come back. So that, I would have, that oh, Rocky, right. that, that is the vertical expertise is what you do. <clears throat> and that would say why Amazon is gonna win in retail in general, right? They're gonna completely remake the retail part of the US economy because they figured out how to do it. Mm. That's possible. That wasn't where I was expecting it to go. But, I mean, Amazon, I mean, they rent, they rent their warehouse space and they give their providers, their ship, you know, vendors of products an API to ship product to you, right? Yeah. I mean, and, that's what they do. And yet we see all these, these uh, warehouse folks striking. And one of the things I noticed in a report that was, uh, Alibaba or some one of the Chinese companies that were taking on Amazon is they've got robots that move entire stacks of pallets and whatnot. And those robots and the warehouse are organized differently 
such that the robots work specific sectors and hand off to robots in other sectors. And there's an organization, whereas with Amazon, because they've got cheap labor, their, their labor doesn't cost as much as the robots in lots of ways. They're literally a person who goes and picks something off a shelf. They can be sent from one end of the warehouse to the other, and they have a time limit on when they have to get that item. And then their next item can send them back to that place from where they started the first time around. And so there is a lack of efficiency in the Amazon warehouses that they're not addressing because they have cheap human labor that so far hasn't complained. Whereas some of the Asians have sat there and said, how do we reorganize this whole warehouse thing to be more efficient and respond more quickly? Yeah, but it's still cheap. I mean, ultimately, yeah, it's still you would. So we were talking about we were talking adjust. about the yeah, but but in the world of miserable conditions for <coughs> unskilled labor, I mean, none of them really helps, right? Yeah. Well, I, if I, you, I, I get, sorry, go I, ahead, there's, there's, there's got to be there's got to be something more. I mean, I, I don't I haven't followed the Amazon warehouse stuff, um, you know, um, but I know my brother works in a, a company that's had automation in in. The, the it, it, they do tubing and heavy steel. They've been automated for a decade. You mm -hmm. know, at EHL, right? Um, you know, one of the tasks we had to do was just automation of the, the sorting centers, and and the, the variation in um, workflow or packet flow through those things was massively expensive. And having to ship people, I mean, you're talking about a six mile facility. It's extremely expensive to ship people from one end of the warehouse to another. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying. I just, to me, it just doesn't make sense because just a little bit of logistics background I have, that, that's a super expensive operation. And, and even if it's not the dollar cost, it's just the efficiency of getting things in and out of that factory. It just doesn't quite ring into that in my head. Yep. And Amazon doesn't, they, they haven't applied logistics to their warehouse because they have cheap labor in the warehouse. But yeah, I mean, the labor in China is certainly cheaper than the labor in the state. So I, I don't understand how cheap labor is why they're doing I just, it feels like uh, there's it's, something underneath that one. So the, the Asians aren't, aren't concerned so much about labor as efficiency. So it's a priority thing. And they really like efficiency. Uh, and they like to keep their workers semi-happy. So if they can make it more efficient, and even eliminate workers, they're perfectly happy to do that. That means that they get an item off the shelf in 10 minutes instead of 30 or, or one minute instead of 10. And then it's all just delivered to the places like the, the people who have to box it. And because they're abnormally shaped or whatnot, you need humans to do that. It's something that can't be automated so they're they're working on efficiency to eliminate those things that can be automated more quickly than Amazon is because well, Amazon, to, Amazon's more worried that, about cost. To, to shift the topic, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I think what you said that I, I kind of agreed with is Thanks. the reality check is Amazon has the tenure a head start on most everyone else. Right, on developing cloud systems, on developing automation, everything else. And so one of the reasons I think you've seen them be able to go into these new marketplaces is they have developed the competencies to kind of do that kind of to your boss to work on and stuff. Yes. Yes. And, and and yeah, infrastructure and competencies are really are are critical from that that perspective. I think, I think we, there was a thread on Twitter talking about, this was uh, Corey Quinn about burning, you know, burning, burning everything down. That's the easy way to start everything. And I'm like, burning things down does not result in faster solutions. Usually, um, usually <laughs> the faster solution is to fix the thing that you've got um, rather than start over from scratch, speaking from personal experience multiple times, but cloth, cloth. I was just going to say like, Burning everything down is the shortest path, but it's not necessarily the fastest. Why, why do you think it's shorter? 
Um, it's ripping well, the Band-Aid off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'm taking the, the, the AT analogy here where um, if, I, if I were to set up, let's say, a new CICD pipeline, okay. um, I can either make it backwards compatible and go to multiple steps uh, and and then eventually get to a point where I have the new state, or I can throw the old one away and start a new one. For me personally, and, 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 and for me, that's the shortest path, throwing the old one away and adding the new one is, is the most effective. But holistically, by throwing everything away and starting again, I create that gap where everyone else is affected negatively. The people who so. depend on, on that existing pipeline. And holistic is, I think, the word I, in some ways I was trying to get to with Asian culture versus American culture and technology. Mm. You know, you can't really solve the COVID problem with a bunch of software hackers, even though they think they can solve everything. And the Asian technologists understand they need different disciplines to create a holistic answer. So I, does this get Rob to your whole point about complexity? So in a sense, and maybe it's just a stretch, but if I take Rocky's premise, is that what he, she, to me, what she's talking about, and Rocky, please correct me if I'm saying this wrong, is that there is a focus on higher or solving the higher level of the problem extracts and and less a focus on a repeatable task that can be done through automation, though it may seem more costly, what they're looking at potentially is the value proposition of focusing on the higher level of extraction problem, uh, pro ex level of extraction of a problem and recouping the cost over time of that lower level effort, thus raising the knowledge base of their team I hadn't quite gotten to that state. Thank you for actually coalescing it into, yeah. And the, the culture is solving the overall thing and it's part of the culture. It's to them, the value is the harmony of everything. To us, it's just, we've got that focus down in a detail that's not so overarching. You said that wonderfully. Thank you. Yeah, I I want to I would pull this out of the cultural context for a minute. Although I, I think there's an element here in in systems thinking versus is not the the thing that I was going to come back to was um, this idea of a Jevons paradox of complexity that we right. So one of the things that I see all the time with with you know the the, the innovation cultures we're in is finding a very small blast radius, a tool, something you can do. And then because you have control of that tool and you don't have control of the adjacent systems, you, 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 know, you, you feast on that span of control. I, it's, it's sort of like the way cloud came about. It was because you, know, you could sell a whole bunch of infrastructure on a credit card. And so all of a sudden people are bypassing IT where they're taking a systems view of a, of a thing and saying, you know what, I'm just going to go to the cloud. I'm going to get my thing done. I'm going to make it work. You know, yay, I'm, I'm done. And so we created this buffet of all of these little pieces that individually are simpler units, but they're not a system, an integrated system that works together. Um, and then I think it was Keith, one of the, you, you made this comment that made me realize that we've made the cost of adding complexity, and I'm assuming everybody knows what Jevons paradox is, I'll, I'll step back in a second. The cost of adding complexity to a system has been going down because of the mm -hmm. way we've built our systems. Yes. And so it, with, with Jevons paradox, it says if you reduce the cost of something, the utilization goes up more. So if we have made it cheaper to add complexity to a system, <laughs> then we are really in trouble because that means we're, we're seeing, and we're seeing this, a huge complexity, a huge explosion of complexity because complexity has gotten cheaper. 
Does that make sense? And then that's going to build really, really fragile systems. Yes. Oh God, yeah. So if the world falls at the, at some point. The whole thing falls apart because you hit the limits. Is it is it more complex because of? So I, I go back in the in the day, yeah. right? You, you had a choice. It was Windows or Mac or or <laughs> Yeah. Right. It is. So I think the complexity comes about in in a different way. I think the complexity comes about because now the choice has been split. Right. There, there's ten, probably a hundred different cloud providers, each one with different interfaces to be able to get into that. Right. And then our, our software stacks, I mean, it used to be provisioning something, installing the OS and, and formatting the drive. Right. It's gotten more complex now because some of those resources have been abstracted out for good reasons. Right. The software development stack has been abstracted out. Right. You have service meshes now, microservices, all these other things. So we, we engineered our way into fragmentation and we've increased the complexity because it had. It allowed us to isolate and improve individual pieces more quickly, right? I mean, isn't that kind of the crux of where the from? I, yes. I mean, so if if we, because what you just described, if you go back, we would have moved a little more slowly. We would have made sure there were standards and compatibility. In this case, the the commercial drivers and the way we built it, it's like you know what I. Um, I don't, you know, the, the vendors don't care or they have their own incentives to not, not collaborate. So they're like, Hey, I'll just fragment this and I'll make it work for myself and everything's good. Yeah. The, the vendors do care. It benefits them to create um, entanglements. Ugh. It means it's tougher for you to switch away. I mean, I, uh, every product marketing conversation I've had, even if you're trying to build open source products is what's our entanglement strategy. Especially if you're building open source products, because that's the only strategy that you've got. Um, non sequitur uh, here, while Rob thinks, uh, uh, have you know? Have you seen where the uh, the malware has become open source? The the stuff for scamming uh, scamming debit cards from the unemployed people getting unemployment insurance. That's now an open source software package. Available yeah. on the dark web. It's, it's been that way for years. There's there's such a it was just, just so much marketing. Yeah, it's but they're easier. talking about it on TV and they keep saying open source, open source. I'm going, oh man. So yeah, open I source think. is gonna become the, the current day hackers. <laughs> yeah. the, that, I mean that la launching a bot attack now is a, a, a ninety dollar <laughs> or thirty dollar credit card charge. But so if, if we look at this, complexity is getting not just cheaper, but there's a monetary incentive for adding complexity into the system. John, that, that's what you, that's where you went. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I think the topic I thought you were going down is, is are things, it, are, why are things getting more complex? Are they going to continue to get more complex? You know, there's a byproduct of that, which is the fragility you mentioned into these things. Okay. There's economic byproducts. Right, but the topic is complexity. Then I think understanding how we got to where we're at would would help us understand where we probably want to directionally aim to. Right. So in 2030, we'll have a shift left uh, <laughs> movement for automation, uh, deployment, and management automation distributed. <laughs> so that's where 2030 cloud is. The shift left movement. It doesn't help if, if, I if, don't know. If, this is the first part of the conversation. That doesn't help if, if the people on the left hand sides don't have the skill sets to implement. That I but but I also I also true. think that part of the challenge here is that you get into this this complexity is a is a is a business weapon. And then you're like, well, the way to avoid complexity is I'm just all in on Amazon and Amazon for their own reasons are you know, homogenizing, although they don't do a very good job of it, homogenizing the experience on, an, on a goal to eliminate complexity, right? But you do get back to, like, one of the things complexity, as we talked about before, Amazon charges you for each individual thing. And you look at companies like yeah. our store, Wasabi, right? And they charge you 20% for storage, what Amazon does, because they basically give you a flat fee for storage, right? They don't monetize every little piece to it. So I think 
some of that stuff, I think there's a market correction that will occur naturally. But of course, I what would what so story. what what would trigger what would trigger the market correction? Is it a, a better competitor? Is it a new thing? Is it a is customers you know signing off from that strategy? I think it's your boss getting a two hundred thousand dollars storage bill from Amazon and going, there's got to be a better way of doing this. And you start looking at alternatives. You go, oh, look, there's a number of people that can do this for 20%. My bill just went to 40,000, right? I, I think there's economic corrections that potentially happen. And then I do think, you know, there, there will be, um, you know, I think you've had people that have tried to create these multi-cloud solutions for a while and they have not been horribly successful. Right. Um, you know, so I think, but I, I think that's something that can possibly change the future. You have to keep in mind, though, that the that there's there's also a cost to move away from 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 one implementation to another. So, so Amazon is pretty much riding on the fact that they are they are pricing themselves at just below the cost to move away from them. I think they're way over the cost to move away. And I think, you know, the, the one thing I saw this morning before I got on, it was interesting to keep talking about Amazon, it was, it was interesting to see that Azure um, 2x the revenue of AWS. They're not twice as big in cloud as AWS is. The revenue is twice as big? That's what I saw. That's pretty cool. <laughs> that seems counterindicated to my experience with people using Azure, but they it could be they just have the, more. Uh, well, they always had they always had the the enterprise base with which to grow that from. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were a .NET shop, you're a .NET shop. Uh -oh. But it's a lot of it's because of COVID and BDI, virtual desktop. And part of it's just and everybody accounting. does Windows. And part of it's just accounting. <laughs> yep. Good point, That's Simon. <laughs> Good point, Simon. But I'm I'm still stuck, and we'll we'll pick up uh, GitOps. Actually, what I what I want to do is take the last couple minutes and um, and look at framing the GitOps conversation because I I do actually want to talk about that. But before we, uh, but this this complexity, I mean, from a from a building infrastructures question, right? Are people trying to limit the things that we're talking about are real concerns. Does that mean I limit complexity or do I add complexity to, re to retain power as a consumer? Is, is that my choice? Is that my, the options I've got? I mean, maybe I don't care. Maybe. You don't care. You care about usability as a user. So if, if going with your premise that the, the 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 viewpoint that you're coming from is from an end user. You want acceleration to your needs at a low cost in a push button operation. The complexity is what yeah. we as engineers, I believe, get to to make that complex thing simple to the end user, right? The added complexity is for two reasons. One, how to make it simple at the end user, but also how to make it so that we don't have to maintain it every minute of every hour of every day, right? In order to do that, you have to go to the level of the, of extraction to go, oh, let's let's solve for every scenario we think possible and right. have that do it in an automated fashion, right? So there is a the complexity. I mean, who, who everyone knows it's a lot easier to go to your command com, um, command line write us take one of your scripts that you always done throw that up there but we go infrastructure as code why because we say you want to write it in a way that's extensible that's repeatable that's auditable mm -hmm. that other people can take from it, extract from it use it and leverage it so we've added a level of complexity by creating a code framework to achieve the same thing we used to do with scripts i look everyone okay. knows i'm an infrastructure as code guy i believe in it my point there is the complexity has come into the play. I be, I think complexity is needed. So I'm not mm. mad at complexity. What I'm mad at or I'm concerned about is in our first to create a more efficient operation, we've 
made it complex to so so complex to the extent in which you know it's like it's my whole kubernetes thing right if kubernetes is so great why do you have to always have 15 other different products to make it work more efficiently <laughs> That's how I feel every time I look at the landscape. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. I think DevOps is a labor movement. Is a labor movement? Yeah. I mean, imagine once you built your app and you and you need mm. a whole crew of DevOps people to keep the thing running. They have jobs for life. You cannot get rid of them, right? And oh, so man, it's not standardized, right? Yeah. It's not standardized. Yeah. It's not standardized. It's a great play. Yeah, it's a great. Uh, <laughs> you, you've described the world like we're in, though, right? You, you've got increasing complexity, yeah. and everything's a snowflake. Right. And so, so your ability. I mean, if you were if you were a DevOps, you know, we are DevOps engineers, right? If we're doing this work, you can go to a new a new environment. A lot of the skills you have are maybe useful, but a lot of the specifics on the knowledge and how things are built are going to be totally bespoke for the next environment. Yeah, I, I think, you know, at least my, my theory on this, right? I, I think, and some of the stuff we've been trying to work on is, and, and go back to key side, right? When someone wants to go deploy an application, they don't care about the complexity of it. They, they care about the cost of it. They care about the simplicity of it. They care about the reliability of it, right? So I do think you can start building frameworks that um, create consistency into these things and you can offer them up to the consumers at, at a price and a quality that is going to exceed what they build on their own, right? So, so do, do you think people are willing to add complexity if it ultimately saves them money for that? Is that a... Well, I think there's two sides. Once again, I'm going to go back to being the, the developer or, or the business person on that side, right? I don't care whether you deploy an AWS, Azure, or whatever stack you do. I just want it to be simple, fast, and reliable. Okay. Right? Now, you know, what we don't have today is services that make it simple, fast, and reliable to deploy on top of different clouds. Right? But I do think that's going to change. I, I do think you'll have the ability to go to a a SaaS provider that will normalize out the different cloud, that they will deal with the complexity to it. And they'll just make it cheaper and faster for people to pull. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 mm. I agree with, yeah. with, with, with both Keith and, and, and Sean here in that, I mean, uh, on, on the on Keith side, like you, you gotta add complexity somewhere to remove, to, in order to remove that complexity somewhere else. So, so th that's the, the shifting of complexity from, from one part from the other. Um, John, I, I also agree with you that, that really like, it, it, it's, not, it's not the ultimate goal to, redu to reduce complexity. It's just that it, it's been hammered into us so much or over really the, the, the past 23 years that, that, that as a rule, higher complexity is lower reliability, like the, the keep it simple, stupid principle. But I mean, there are limits to that principle. Like ju just like, like, sure. like, like mm -hmm. taking it in, in a different perspective, like Occam's Racer. Occam's Racer is, is like everything else being equal, the simple solution is the best. The, the problem is that people tend to forget that everything else being equal part. It, it, it's not always equal. It, like it, if a solution is more, has more complexity in, in one place, but less complexity in another. This, it's, I, 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 I like what you're saying. I mean, I'm, I'm, I think it's reasonable to rethink that premise, especially if we're talking about a Jevons paradox for complexity. The idea is, is that it's not all bad, right? That we're, we're saying, you know what? I just made it much cheaper to add a complex thing into my system, right? I just made it cheaper to add AI. I've made it cheaper to add, you know, uh, flow analysis and, uh, you know, Elastic and all these, all these services that used to be way too complex for people to do. We're now saying, yeah, you can just click some buttons and, and add this new thing into your, your, it's a, it's now a, a resource, right? The, com the, your complexity went up, but at very minimal, 
actual cost. Is, I mean, yeah. am, am I taking it in, those, in the direction you were thinking? Yes, kind of. Like it, you, your complexity goes up, and let, let's say linearly, but your benefits from that complexity are, are more than linear. I don't know if exponential, maybe quadratic, mm -hmm. or but but they're definitely better than linear. So yeah. so the so you add complexity, yes, but you also add value. Yes, I mean, I, I, I literally sat here last night debating in my head whether I was making things more complex. <laughs> so we're writing code generators for creating CI CD pipelines, right? And yeah. in one side, it's, I don't have to keep repeating the same code over and over and over again for each product. On the other side, I was getting lost in my own code, right? When, when I'm, yeah, <laughs> yeah could, could it. and everything else, and it's like, is, is this better? Or is it worse? And then at the end of the day, it will be better, but it took a lot of work then to create a complex system that should make it much more simplistically <laughs> and much more reliable to, to do these things. So the one thing I didn't want to have was snowflakes all over the place. I code code generators are a really good yeah, example, John, because I I feel like they they are this they have a they have a tipping point in them where you the edge the edge cases crush the the the, the value of the generator um it's a really good example actually i'm very rare I've, I've i've done a lot of code generators in my in my days and they almost never survive into into long-term use i think you, you have to understand what portions you can generate what portions you can't right yeah I think it was you know back in the early days of AI, right? When when Lambda actually met Lambda, it was code that wrote code, right? There, there were certain use cases in neural mm. net where it made sense to do those things, right? And and but they weren't the entirety of the code. They were basically places that functionality could be learned and added in a dynamic fashion to it. If, if you're talking about code generators that basically generate entire programs, I don't think you'll ever get there. Right. I, I think right. if you're talking about eliminating the 80% of a, a microservice or a serverless framework that's repeated over and over and over again, I think it makes complete sense. When it's strongly patterned. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. That's actually part of part of what when we look at automation patterns for uh, for what we do. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I just I, I, we have you know 90% of automation patterns that we see are the are the same the problem is that the night the 10 percent that's different are distributed throughout the 90 percent and that's been that's been what's an example of that uh provisioning an operating system and configuring it to run an app is 95 percent the same code but when it comes to installing a library um, I mean, this is, this is, I, I, I could go through, like, we provision against every cloud, every cloud's provisioning infrastructure is different, but they all give me a Linux, but they all have different logins for that Linux environment. Once I get onto the Linux environment, they, I can, I can use, you know, uh, curl on all of the environments, but if it's not installed, installing curl on the environment is different in every Linux. Um, and so what I've got is I've got a system where if you, you could look at the system and say, okay, yeah, this is, in, you know, bring a machine up. Great. That's pretty standard. And log into the machine. That's pretty standard. And, you know, curl something. That's pretty standard. But in between all of that stuff, I have got to be able to say, wait a second, this is Amazon. That means I'm using EC2 user. This is Microsoft. That means I'm using um, the name of the um, Google. I'm using the name of a, the account and Microsoft. I'm using root and, you know, I, you know, so it's, it's all of that, like, those are all differences. They're minor differences, but they break the commonality of pattern. And so you have to account for it when you build, when you build stuff. And it's not like I just get to do, give me a machine on a cloud and then here's the stuff I'm installing. It's, it's the whole chain has variation throughout it. So like that kind of thing, I mean, it's all stack work just fine to solve that class of problems, right? The, the class of problems that didn't work fine was, was you know, to solve for the network, 
the VPCs or the other pieces that the, the networks are an area where no one has built a reasonable structure. It's hard. But even even my my experience, I'm not as familiar with salt, um, but doing that in a way that was reusable patterns over and over again, even was was really hard. So that, you know, we, you know, every time I've picked up tooling like that, it's been like, okay, I have to figure out how to tweak it from the thing that I've done. Um, and so ahead, in, in adding into that, jumping in, <clears throat> adding to that complexity is the tooling, i.e. salt sack, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, Pulumi, you name it, put it here, is only as good as the tooling can uh, handle the complexities of the individual cloud or target environment. And that's true for SaltStack or anything. And that's the problem that Rob is addressing is the minutia of detail, although a lot of it can be extrapolated away, it's different in a lot of different places. And those final details of all of those different places, every time you touch a new customer, a new environment, a new install, a new cloud provider, a new service, are slightly different and require tweaking to support uh, those variations. That's where that 10% pain comes in. What, what I actually found it harder to do, and, and mm. I mean, we, we had our stuff written on top of salt to deal with where we needed to do some additional stuff into it. Where I really fought tooth and nail um, was to kill off the proliferation of networking and hardware underneath it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you know, lim limit the number of variants. I mean, th there are like people in China that wanted, we've got 4,000 servers we weren't sure what to do with, right? Well, that's because they're five years old. They're worthless to me. They're inefficient. They take more power than revenue they generate. No, 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 but great business deal. Do it anyway. So I don't want to do it. I fought tooth and nail to keep that proliferation down, you know, which limited some of those pieces to it. Um, but, you know, I think that was kind of some of that. I mean, yeah, the lower, the lower we get, the harder it gets. I think that's just the note. Makes a lot of sense. All right, we're, we're out of time and this has been, uh, as always, expanding my brain and making me think. Uh, I do wanna talk GitOps next next week, if that's all right with people. I'm, I'm interested in use cases and what people are trying to do with it. Because in the last, I've had some conversations the last couple of weeks where what I thought I understood was GitOps, I was not GitOps. Cool. So, <laughs> Klaus, did, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I use what, what I think is skill, so, <laughs> so I, I was, it, will, it will be relevant to me. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, I, I was sort of like the, what we've done with infrastructure as code and keep doing. Um, so, cool. All right, everybody, thank you. Always a pleasant conversation, and we covered a lot of ground today. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, all. Sorry, I'm a little bit foggier than normal. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Thanks, all. Wow, that was a great conversation. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. We are definitely going to be exploring this Jevons paradox of complexity idea. Uh, and then every Thursday, we're talking about these broader questions of the way cloud is going to get rolled out over the last 10 years. And if we think it's going in the right direction, and if it's not, how to change it. That's what this is about. Looking forward to hearing from you as part of the Cloud 2030. Thanks.